Welcome to Witch Hunt, the podcast bringing you the history of witch trials. I'm Josh Hutchinson. I'm Sarah Jack. This episode is a look back at New England witch trials. We speak with Paul Moyer, the author of publications on witch trial history, including Detestable and Wicked Arts, New England, and Witch Hunting in the English Atlantic, 1640 to 1670, and the article Diabolical Duos, Witch Spouses in Early New England, featured in the Early American Studies Journal. Today, we touch on many of the witch trials of New England, including the Hartford Witch Panic and the Salem Witch Trials, as well as many smaller events. Moyer discusses witchcraft's roots in New England and back in Europe. Salem's witch hunts in 1692 and 93 are highlighted as pivotal moments that significantly soured New Englanders' appetite for witch trials. Moyer also highlights the transatlantic connections of witch hunting practices and legal precedents between New England and Europe. Welcome to Witch Hunt author and professor Paul B. Moyer of SUNY Brockport. I've been a history professor or working full-time at university since 1999. I got my graduate degree from the College of William and Mary in early American history. I taught at the uh, College of William and Mary and at the, uh, the State University of New York at Brockport. I've developed a long-term interest in the topic of witchcraft in the midst of my studies in early American history. Could you share the key historical events or societal shifts during the period covered in your book, Detestable and Wicked Arts, that significantly influence the belief in witchcraft? It's hard to link changes in the belief in witchcraft to specific events. It's a long-term process. The belief in witchcraft existed in early modern Europe for hundreds of years before colonial New England ever existed. There's a lot of consistency, actually, with witchcraft beliefs in New England that go back to hundreds of years in Europe. But it's not the kind of thing where you can point to a specific event and say, oh, this had, there are a few exceptions. I think Salem, the Salem witch hunts in 1692-93 definitely sour New Englanders' appetite for more witch hunts. But other than that, it's more of a deep-rooted cultural and social construct that is really resistant to everyday sorts of actions or events. So it's something that you have to really think about deeper social and cultural change in a society. So for example, something like changing gender norms and how that changes over the course of centuries or long periods of time. But it's hard to pinpoint a specific date or event, something that kind of drives that sort of change. It's slow and incremental and often hard to see in the short term. You have to really look in the long term. How do you seek to expand understanding of witch trial history through your research and writing? I guess the two points I would make, the first one is more focused on specifically New England and people studying witch hunting in New England. And one point I really try to get across in my book is that witch hunting in New England does not come out of nowhere. It has deep roots in legal procedures and legal precedents going back to old England. So it's that kind of connection, that kind of transatlantic connection. And in fact, in the, the last chapter of my book, I really detail on how the, the kind of rules of witch hunting, the procedures of witch hunting, and the debates over witch hunting, all of that can, you can directly connect back to things, not only in England, but in, in the rest of Europe. So that's point number one. There's this transatlantic dimension to it. The other point that I try to get across in my book, and this kind of, I think, works against a stereotype that we have in New England. And that stereotype is that New Englanders were these rabid witch hunters, where at the drop of a hat, not only would they prosecute a witch, but they would hang a witch. And generally, that's not the case. Obviously, people in the 17th century had a different worldview than we have today. But in the context of their time, more often than not, Witch hunts were judicial procedures in which there was restraint. There was a process. There are exceptions to this. And we remember the exceptions. We remember things like Salem, where things did get out of control. But even at the time, people recognized right after the Salem crisis, they recognized that they had done a horrible thing and made a horrible mistake. Outside of events like Salem, if you're accused of witchcraft in New England, chances are, A, you're not going to be convicted. I think the conviction rate was around one, one out of three at best. And 
even if you're convicted, you have a chance of escaping execution. They did have judicial review. Convictions were overturned because of faulty evidence. That's the second thing I wanted to get across. And I'm not the only person to stress this, but this notion that we can't think of witch hunting as this craze, as an out of control process. It could on occasion get that way, but that was the exception rather than the rule. Can you elaborate on how the religious conflicts in Hartford prior to the witch panic contributed to an atmosphere conducive to witchcraft accusations? Yeah, and there's definitely a connection between religious divisions in Hartford and the big Hartford witch hunt of 1662-63. Unfortunately, from a historical point of view, our documentation on the exact nature of the religious conflict in Hartford is thin. We do know that basically it was a conflict over authority between the uh, local minister in Hartford, Samuel Stone, and his congregation. And Hartford's not unique in that at that time. In fact, there's a number of similar conflicts going on across New England at that time. So in a way, the exact reason for the conflict probably isn't as important as the fact that the conflict existed, that there was this conflict that it endured throughout the entire decade of the 1650s, which meant that by the time 1662 rolls around, you have a very divided community. You have a community with a, a, with a history of social conflict and animosity. And I think one thing that we do know about witchcraft, it seems to pop up in, in conditions in which there is social discord, in which there is social conflict. And obviously Hartford is a place like that. So we don't know a lot about the specifics of what was going on in terms of the religious conflict, what exactly were the doctrines that were being battled over. We, we're not even really clear on the exact nature of the factions. We do know it happened. And there is this enduring connection between conflict and witchcraft. And the conflict wouldn't even have to be a religious conflict. It'd be any sort of conflict potentially can trigger a witchcraft accusation. So Hartford is a tricky episode to deal with. It's one of New England's largest witchcraft episodes, but it's also, unfortunately, one of the poorest documented. We don't have the sort of document base that we do for, say, events like the Salem witchcraft trials of 1692. It's frustratingly vague, but I think I can definitely make the kind of connection that this religious conflict is an important kind of precondition for the witch hunt. How do Maleficium and Diabolism both fit into the historical context of New England witch trials? Even before you get to colonial New England, there are a couple different outlooks as to exactly what, what is in the early modern period. The first one um, is what I refer to as an uh, action-oriented definition of the crime. A witch is simply a person who uses magic to harm others, period. That's it. If, if you do that, you're a witch. And in Europe at this time, in, in the uh, medieval, early modern period, this was referred to as malfeasium, which was a Latin term that referred to basically magical crime. And that certainly carried over. So New Englanders believed that witches made people ill. They killed people. They made livestock ill. They did all, they could do all kinds of things. They could make your beer go bad. They could make your cheese moldy. Any kind of misfortune that happened to you, be it Serious or stuff that we would see as sort of mundane could potentially, not always, but potentially be attributed to malfeasium, that there's somebody out there using magic to cause you misfortune. The other view that also, and this is actually, this view is far more unique to Western Europe. This idea of malfeasium, you can find this idea basically around the world. They don't necessarily call it malfeasium, but it's the same idea, which is somebody who simply uses magic to harm. But in Western Europe, in the late medieval and early modern period, we have this other view of witchcraft diabolism. And this definition of witchcraft doesn't focus on what the witch does with their powers. It focuses on where the witch gets their powers from in the first place. And under the definition of diabolism, witches get their power from Satan. That witches are basically devil worshipers. They form pacts with Satan. They worship Satan. And in return for that, Satan gives them the power to do harm and do mischief. According to Malfeasium, and not surprisingly, this idea is first generated within the Catholic Church in Europe and then spreads beyond the Catholic Church into several Protestant denominations in early modern Europe. This view of witchcraft is a religious-based view of the crime. 
which is our heretics, which is our enemies of Christianity. So both of these ideas are current in New England during the colonial period. And I guess the other point I would make is these two ideas are distinct from each other, but they're also very compatible with each other, especially in New England. Ordinary New Englanders who might have been most worried about the harm that witches did could also readily believe that witches got their power from the devil. In their mind, those two things could both be true. Conversely, a minister in New England who might have been most concerned about this kind of dia diabolical view of witchcraft, that witches were actually servants of Satan, they also had no problem believing that one of the things that Satan could do was to basically provide witches with the power to do all sorts of harm in the everyday world. So these views of witchcraft are distinct, but they're also compatible, especially in a place like New England. And, and maybe a final point to make, back in old Europe, there was often a, a large gulf between the clergy and their beliefs and their world and the world of ordinary people. And they could have very different beliefs from each other. In New England, clearly ordinary people and clergy aren't always exactly on the same page. But if you consider the kind of people who came to New England in the first place, a lot of them were devout Puritans. Religion played a very important role in their everyday lives, that there seemed to be not as much of a gap between the views of clergymen and views of ordinary people in New England. So I think there's a lot more consensus in New England. And Malthusian, Diabolism, they just ended up being flip sides of, of the same coin of witchcraft. What personal and community social function do witch hunts serve? So there are historians and anthropologists who have argued that witchcraft beliefs exist because they play certain roles in society. They do useful things. Now, I should point out, not everybody accepts this. And even scholars who do argue that witchcraft has certain functions, even they admit that on certain occasions, witchcraft can also be very dysfunctional, that it can create a lot of damage and disorder. Like Salem is an example of sort of a witch hunt run amok where witchcraft might serve these social functions, but at a certain point, once a witch hunt gets out of control, then it can become in itself damaging. But anyway, to get back to this idea of, of the functions of witchcraft, I would think of it on, on two different levels. First of all, witchcraft has what I would refer to as sort of personal functions. It can help individuals kind of navigate their way through everyday life. For example, witchcraft, number one, provides an explanation for why things happen to you, and in particular, why bad things happen to you. In a time before widespread scientific knowledge, People didn't understand disease. People didn't understand a variety of things, weather phenomenon, what have you. And potentially witchcraft was a convenient explanation for all kinds of illness, bad weather, death, what have you. And I think on a psychological level, understanding why something is happening to you, I think provides a certain amount of agency or psychological comfort. The second personal function that witchcraft serves, not only does it identify why bad things happen to you, Perhaps more importantly, it identifies who is causing those bad things to happen to you. And then you can actually do something about it. You can take your revenge upon that person, be it through legal or extra legal means. And I think it's not hard to see from a psychological dimension how that is especially comforting and empowering. That not only can you identify why something is happening to you, why some misfortune occurs, but you can also do something about it. So I think Witchcraft provides those important kind of psychological comforts or however you want to phrase it. Besides these sort of personal level functions of witchcraft, there's also community level functions of witchcraft. And I, I just named the top two. Number one, the witch in a way is the opposite of what a good person is supposed to be. The witch, that the figure of the witch kind of identifies behaviors that are socially unacceptable. The idea of witchcraft is a, a convenient way for communities to draw a dividing line between acceptable and unacceptable behavior. Not only does it do that, it provides a mean to potentially punish antisocial behavior. So in that sense, witchcraft can be a form of social control. It, it a, identifies what you can do and what you can't do, and B, potentially, if you do the things you're not supposed to do, it can punish you for them. It can punish you for being a bad person. In a way, witchcraft is a way of punishing people for things that aren't strictly illegal, 
but at the same time are seen as disruptive and antisocial. Another kind of community function of witchcraft, some have argued it's almost like a form of community catharsis. It is a common enterprise that can bring divided communities together. And there's almost ritual purging of evil or impurity from the community. And going back to the Hartford witch hunt of 1662, I think that that could be a valid connection, that Hartford is a community that is divided. There's a lot of guilt over that division. Good Puritans are not supposed to be at war with each other. And perhaps that witchcraft was a sort of cathartic moment that could bring the community together in a, a common endeavor to expel impurity or sin from the community. So that's just a brief rundown of this idea that witchcraft has these social functions that explains why witchcraft belief endures. I think some would argue that if witchcraft didn't have any kind of redeeming social functions, it probably not a belief that would endure that long, or it certainly wouldn't be something that pops up as often as it does in the early modern world. How do shifts in societal pressures, such as the decrease in wartime tensions, contribute to witch hunting? Yeah, this connects back to something we talked about earlier, the connection between religious conflict in Hartford and the witch hunt. And the scholar that comes to mind when I'm talking about this topic is John Demos. And he wrote this book, Entertaining Satan, uh, around early 80s. It's still a landmark work in the study of New England witchcraft. And he broadly argued that there's a relationship between widespread conflict and widespread social anxiety and witchcraft. In periods in which things are going well, if the crops are growing well, there's no massive epidemics of disease, there's no wars or anything like that. Those tend to be situations that perhaps aren't conducive to witchcraft accusations. They don't create the sort of social tensions that seem to generate witchcraft fears. On the other hand, he put forward the idea, if you have wars, if you have epidemics, if you have these sort of large scale social misfortunes that could be conducive to, it's almost like the preconditions for a, a witch hunt. Yeah, and, it, you know, maybe to specifically illustrate this, going back to the Salem witch trials of 1692, the Salem witch trials take place in the midst of a, of a massive Indian war uh, on the northern frontier in Maine. And some people have argued that Indian war is, is part of the social context that, that leads to Salem. And maybe to complicate things even a little bit further, and going back to John Demos, the specific argument that he makes is that witchcraft accusations oftentimes crop up in the immediate aftermath of conflicts. While you're in the midst of a war or while you're in the midst of a religious controversy like Hartford had in the 1650s, put it simplistically, you're preoccupied by that. You're too busy with that real conflict to deal with the imagined conflict of witchcraft. But once those conflicts are over, once the war is over or the religious conflict is over or the epidemic has passed through, in the aftermath of that, then people begin to wonder, okay, why did this happen to us? What could have caused this to happen? And those sorts of wonderings seem to open the door for witchcraft suspicions and witchcraft accusations. There is this rather complicated relationship between witchcraft and societal pressures and societal conflict. I think one of the pioneers in thinking about this is John Demos in his book, Entertaining Satan. What was the judicial role in creating and ending witch panics? Yeah, the judiciary didn't necessarily start witch panics. All that took was ordinary people who basically raised the specter of witchcraft, that they believed that they were assaulted by witches and then started the process of a complaint. But once those witchcraft complaints become official, then they enter the judicial system. And at that point, the judiciary plays a huge role in witch hunting, at least witch hunting as a judicial project. And I would point out that not all witch hunting in New England or anywhere is judicial. There's also extra legal ways to do it. You can just attack somebody or mob violence or vigilante violence, what have you. Once it gets into the courts, obviously the judiciary has a huge impact on it. And generally speaking, and just maybe focusing on New England, most of the time it appears that courts were generally cautious and restrained 
in the way they approached witchcraft. They wanted evidence of the crime. They wanted credible witnesses, et cetera, et cetera. So there was lots of barriers that you had to pass through in order to promote a successful witch hunt. And if the judiciary was especially skeptical or especially cautious, it was very hard to get, let alone a, a conviction or, uh, or execution, even to get a trial. A lot of times witchcraft cases don't even go to trial. The, the witch is not even indicted. There's not enough evidence. Now, on the other hand, if you happen to have a judge or set of judges who, I don't know, more gullible or for whatever reason, uh, are more supportive uh, of, of, of which prosecution, then you can quickly move from accusations into trials, convictions, and executions. Probably the best example of that in New England is Salem, where for whatever reason, and this is pretty well documented at this point, the judges in charge of Salem make a series of decisions that consistently work in favor of promoting the witch hunt. For example, one concrete example, in New England in the 17th century, generally speaking, in order to accuse somebody of a capital crime like witchcraft, a crime that would result in their execution, you had to put forward a substantial monetary bond with the colony, with the courts. It, it was the court's way of making sure that people weren't making frivolous accusations. For whatever reason, during the Salem crisis, it appears that the court waives that requirement. And that sort of opened the floodgates for people during Salem to basically make an unlimited number of accusations against people. And they didn't have to basically put their money where their mouth is in order for those prosecutions to go forward. So that's an example of how the decisions made by the judiciary could have a big impact. I could also mention in Salem, what makes the situation unique Instead of going through the regular judicial system, the governor of Massachusetts sets up a special court. And that court's only job is to hunt down witches. And not surprisingly, when you give somebody the job of hunting down witches, what do they do? They find witches to hunt down. If you're a hammer, everything becomes a nail. That's another case in which certain judicial decisions are made that fuel the witch hunt. To make a long story short, I think we, we think of witchcraft as a crime of the people. It's ordinary people issuing these accusations. And once those accusations are out there in the world, the witch hunt can continue. But once ordinary people bring those accusations in the courtroom, then the judges can have a, a really big impact on witch hunting. Nine times out of 10, it seems that judges were relatively restrained in their approach. But once in a while, you get a case like Salem in which they take the opposite. And what I'm talking about for New England is also true of Europe. In places where the judiciary was more conservative in their approach, the number of executions and convictions was kept under control. In areas where that wasn't the case, that's where you get the massive numbers of convictions and executions. I can see where the victims that wrote the petitions and rallied their community to support them as innocent, really taking a stab at getting the leadership to stop what was happening to them. Yeah, to pull over to the curb. And a good example of the judiciary playing a decisive role is both Hartford. Once the Hartford hunt is going and people are going to trial, in the midst of that, the governor of Connecticut returns, John Winthrop Jr. He had been away in England lobbying for a new colonial charter. When he comes back to the colony, it seems he definitely brings a more cautious and reserved approach to witch hunting. Once he's back in charge, the convictions and executions stop at Hartford. And the same thing in Salem. Once they get rid of the first court, they install a new court. That new court has different rules. And it's almost like a 180 degree turn. The first court had almost 100% conviction rate. And the second court has almost 100% acquittal rate. So again, it, the attitudes of the judiciary have a huge impact. And you're right. I think the reason that people like John Proctor were writing petitions to the court is that he realized that, you know, they were the key to this whole situation. What are the diabolical duos and what can we learn from them? That's just the article I wrote on husband and wife witch pairs. And one thing I noticed in New England, now husband and wife witches are not unique to New England. But New England seemed to have a relatively high proportion. I guess the main thing I would say about this, and one of the reasons I wrote this article, is just to illustrate the fact that witchcraft and witchcraft accusations are often very reflective of the societies that produce them. 
in New England, marriage was seen as an incredibly important institution. Obviously, it was seen as an important institution throughout Western Europe. But for the Puritans in particular, Puritans didn't have a lot of faith in man-made institutions, government. To them, the real key to social order was the family. And obviously the key to families are strong marriages. So they put a lot of emphasis, not only social, but almost religious emphasis on the importance of marriage. And one thing I argue, because marriage was so important to New England society, it almost became like a very highly sensitive, highly supercharged institution. And anybody who deviated from the norms of marriage, it wasn't just a social infraction for New Englanders. It almost bordered on a religious infraction. If you were not a good spouse, if you were not a good married couple, it was not only a threat to society, but it was a threat to the creation of a godly community. So in those conditions, it's not surprising that couples who appear to deviate from the norm, that deviation might in some circumstances almost be seen as a form of witchcraft or something akin to witchcraft. And so one thing I, I point out in particular, a lot of the earliest married couples who were accused were couples who didn't have many children. Having children, there was a huge emphasis on having children among the early Puritan, the whole be fruitful and multiply thing from Genesis. But also at the time, there was a definite shortage of colonists in there. And so there was a, a lot of emphasis placed on husbands and wives having children. One thing I hypothesize in that article is the reason that couples who fail to have children, the reason that they seem to be targets of witchcraft accusation is that sort of deviance becomes perceived not just as a threat to the population or the social order, it almost is akin to their challenging God's order. They're in challenging God's law. And on a certain level, that begins to be almost akin to witchcraft in the same way that witches are those who challenge God's order, maybe married couples who aren't doing their duties as parents are the same way they're challenged to that order. That's the main point I wanted to make in that article is witchcraft accusations are highly reflective of the societies that produce them, of the social tensions and social concerns of those societies. So for example, in Europe, there are some places in which a lot of children are accused of witchcraft. You don't see that in New England at all. There's very few young people ever accused of witchcraft in New England. And what that tells me is where that society in which children are being accused of witchcraft, there's probably a different configuration of social tensions and social values that are resulting in those accusations against children. So in that place, for whatever reason, the way that witchcraft reflects society is through the accusation of children. In New England, the way that witchcraft reflects New England's kind of specific social order is through the unusual number of married people who are accused. Maybe a third example, if you look at Iceland, there are witchcraft cases in Iceland, 90% of those who are accused of witchcraft are men, which is radically different from, I think, our stereotypical view is that witchcraft suspects are generally women. But obviously in Iceland, there's a different kind of social configuration. There's a different interface between Icelandic society and how they envision crack. What are the key challenges historians encounter when analyzing and interpreting witchcraft cases in early New England? How do these challenges influence our overall understanding of the historical record? I guess the one challenge is the lack of a historical record a lot of times. Documents just don't survive. In many cases, we only have the bare bones information of witchcraft episodes. We know who was accused. We know when they were accused. We know the outcome of the trial, and that's about it. And that's not even counting cases that didn't make it into the judiciary. If you just have informal accusations where somebody's rumored to be a witch or which maybe there's some sort of informal community action taken against that person, it's very hard for that to show up in the historical record. So that's one huge challenge. We often don't have the documentation we would like. Now, I think that's one reason that people gravitate to Salem. It's an innately interesting episode, but it's also a very well-documented episode. So that's one challenge. The other challenge is really just how to understand what these people were going through. And oftentimes when I teach the subject of witchcraft, one of the things I start with is a document. It's actually from Salem. 
in which this person is relating an experience they had in which they saw what they believed what was a witch's familiar, one of the witch's sort of little animal helpers. And they described it, the guy described it as a creature that I think he said it had the body of a chicken and the head of a monkey. This like really just bizarre sort of creature. And I just asked my students, okay, how can we account for this? What are the different possibilities that would help us make sense of this? And oftentimes what it comes down to is, A, the guy's lying. He's making it up. This just didn't happen. And that's one avenue for witchcraft interpretation. Is witchcraft really a story about lies and manipulations and how society used those lies and manipulation for one person to seek revenge upon another? And if you look at Salem, that's definitely a strand of the Salem scholarship that the accusers are simply making this stuff up for whatever reason. Another possibility is that it actually happened. That's almost a, you're almost moving into the realm of the theological there versus the, the historical. The third option is that that witness who saw the, the chicken headed monkey or what have you, he believed him on some level that there's something going on with him that made him believe that. And then you have to ask yourself, well, wh what is going on? Is it psychological? Is he mentally ill? Is it medical? One of the, the theories, and it's now a thoroughly debunked theory about Salem, is that it was all ergot poisoning, that everybody was basically consuming bread that was contaminated with ergot fungus that was making them hallucinate. But again, the challenge with witchcraft interpretation is there's all these different possible avenues for exploration. Is it a story of basically people manufacturing this information, in which case the tale you're telling is a tale of political intrigue and social feuds and conflict? Or are these people really experiencing this stuff? And then the job is how to explain. It. Is it a psychological story? Is it a medical story? Yeah, I think that would be my short answer for these big interpretive challenges. Number one, the lack of documentation. And second, how do you interpret the documents? And one feeds into the other. The lack of documentation then oftentimes leaves us asking questions. Whereas if we had a better documentary record, maybe some of those questions would be better answered. But we're often left with blank spaces in the historical record. And then you have to try to use your historical imagination based on the records we do have, based on the knowledge we have of the past to try to come up with satisfactory answers, which also makes the field of witchcraft a lot of fun. Uh, it's almost like being a detective and where you're trying to piece together this evidence. Yeah, that would be my, the, the short rundown of, of that, of that issue. How has writing about witch trials changed any of your perceptions about witchcraft and early New England? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I guess when I first entered into my studies of witchcraft way back in the day, I started, must have been around 2002 or 2003. In the university I work at, all history majors have to take a research seminar. So they learn the basics of historical research. And I think, what the heck? Let's just look at Salem. It's an interesting episode. It's relatively well-defined. There's a lot of primary documents they can use. And I think entering into it, I also maybe had some of that assumption that, in fact, New Englanders were rabid witch hunters, that there was something in that Puritan psyche that kind of predisposed them to really go after witches in a way that other people didn't. And the more I studied it, A, I found out that wasn't true, that in fact, New Englanders could be very restrained. And B, even if they weren't restrained, that, that didn't make them out of the ordinary. Across much of Europe, there were similar patterns of behavior. And in fact, my interest in New England witchcraft then led me to get more and more interested in witchcraft back in Europe and back in the old world. So yeah, I don't know if, if the study of witchcraft really dramatically changed my big picture view of colonial New England, but I certainly got a, a better feel for the people of New England by looking at witchcraft. What would you like to tell us about your current project, The Execution of Ira Stout, a story of murder and justice in antebellum America? Yeah, it's obviously very different in a way from witchcraft. It's obviously much further along in time. We're in the 19th century in this book. It focuses on a murder and a murder trial in Rochester, New York in 1857 and 1858. And on one level, it's just a, it's just a fascinating story. A, 
I think people are innately interested in murder. It's a particularly gruesome murder. It's who done it. There's a mystery there. Besides murder, there's also accusations of incest. There's an interesting cast of characters, including Frederick Douglass gets involved in the case. Susan B. Anthony gets involved in the case. David Wilmot, most people never heard of him, but he was a very famous figure during the sectional crisis. He pops up during the whole thing. So it's almost like this kind of Forrest Gump look at 19th century America. So it was a fascinating story. But when I looked at the story, I saw that it was a really good way of illustrating different things going on in American society in the decades leading up to the Civil War. And there's a lot of huge changes in America. For example, the book enabled me to discuss basically the emergence of America's social justice movement. People like Frederick Douglass, Susan B. Anthony, anti-slavery, women's rights, all of that kind of intersects with the Iris Stout trial. In his case, the movement there was the anti-capital punish movement, punishment movement, but that was a movement that was intertwined with anti-slavery and women's rights at that. So I could talk about that. There are big changes in the whole criminal justice system at this time, how trials are conducted what the prison was like. Iris Stout ended up, before he was accused of murder, served a term in Eastern State Prison in, in Philadelphia, which is like the most notorious prison in America in the 19th century. So it gave me an opportunity to talk about judicial reform and prison reform and what's going on there. Gender roles and, and how gender changed. The murder victim, Charles Littles, was an utter scoundrel. Literally, the guy walked around with a dagger in his pocket and a bottle of acid that he used to throw on people that he didn't like. And he had a dog he'd kick around. He's just not a nice guy. But it gave me an opportunity to talk about the sort of masculine counterculture that existed in antebellum America at this time. It kind of challenged middle class values and middle class norms. And Charles Littles was a guy who really illustrated that masculine counterculture. So throughout the book, I use the story of the murder and the murder trial, not only to tell the story, which again, is innately interesting and fascinating, but also as a way of opening a window on important social and cultural developments in the antebellum period. And to do it in a way that is supposed to be designed to be just utterly engaging to the audience who's reading it. It's not a academic history in the traditional sense. It sort of attempts to educate people about the antebellum period, but in an enjoyable, entertaining, maybe even lighthearted sort of way. And now for a minute with Mary. A beautiful plaque was placed on St. Stephen's Church in Boston's North End, which states, not far from here on the 16th of November, 1688, good wife Anne Glover was hanged as a witch. First, Goody's given name has not been proven to be Anne. Second, to my knowledge, it has not been proven that an actual gallows was placed at Boston's North End. Based on a map created by Captain John Bonner in 1722, historians know that a gallows was placed at the South Neck going towards Roxbury, where the Cathedral of the Holy Cross now stands. These gallows may have traveled within two blocks from time to time, probably due to the changing tides. Whether or not these gallows existed in 1688 is still uncertain. However, it seems more likely that Goody was hanged there because most hangings, though public, were more often performed on the outskirts of the cities or towns. And this research will continue. Thank you, Mary. Here's Sarah with End Witch Hunt's news. End Witch Hunt news. It's been a fantastic year of captivating guests on Witch Hunt, and 2024 has truly lived up to our expectations. We're grateful for your consistent support, tuning in each week, interacting with us, and spreading the word via your social media channels. Your collaboration and engagement are vital in helping us shed light on the realities of witch hunts, both historical and contemporary. Thank you for being an essential part of our journey to uncover and share these truths. Are you ready for what's next? We're deep into crafting our upcoming original series, Salem Witch Hunt 101. Look forward to the premiere of part one next month. This unmatched series written by Witch Hunt podcaster creator Josh Hutchinson, known online as at Salem Witch Hunt, will offer a thorough examination of the Salem Witch Trials, 
Each part will methodically unpack the complex historical event, relying on original documents and scholarly research to provide insights. Salem Witch Hunt 101 invites descendants of the Salem Witch Trials, as well as anyone interested in the topic, to explore the events and figures of that time with a critical eye. Josh and I, both descendants of Salem Witch Trial ancestors, are passionately committed to revealing the true stories of the individuals embroiled in the Salem Witch Hunt and connecting these authentic narratives with the worldwide audience. We'll delve into the key questions and themes that have emerged from scholarly discussion, aiming to enhance our collective understanding of the trials. For newcomers or those looking to refresh their knowledge, our previous episodes serve as a valuable resource covering not only Salem, but also other witch trials, providing a broader context for the upcoming series. Becoming familiar with the dynamics and facets of the Salem witch trials encourages a critical examination of historical narratives, whose stories are shared, how they're presented, and their influence on modern society. This scrutiny is vital in an era where simplifying the past into single bullet theories and one-dimensional narratives diminishes the rich tapestry of voices that have shaped history. These reflections not only provide insights into addressing today's challenges, but also highlight humanity's potential for both harm and kindness, pushing us towards a more compassionate, and well-informed community. Lastly, we invite you to offer your financial support by contributing to the recently launched GoFundMe campaign by the International Network Against Accusations of Witchcraft and Associated Harmful Practices. Over the past decade, witch hunts and ritual attacks have caused harm to at least 20,000 individuals globally, occurring across 50 countries and on every inhabited continent. These are not historical remnants, but ongoing worldwide crises. In response, the International Network Against Accusations of Witchcraft and Associated Harmful Practices was formed in 2023. Organizations and NGOs worldwide are tirelessly working to support survivors of witchcraft accusations and ritual attacks and to prevent further incidents. To bolster their efforts, the International Network is setting up a small grants program aimed at providing them with crucial assistance. Your support is essential in launching this initiative. Donations will go directly to these frontline organizations, helping them offer aid to affected individuals and fund educational programs to prevent future attacks. What role will you play in this vital mission? If you cannot contribute financially, please take time to learn more about the network and share their GoFundMe campaign with your circle of influence. The link to the campaign is in the show notes. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to Witch Hunt. Join us next week. Have a great today and a beautiful tomorrow. Mm -hmm.